welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. This is a podcast where we talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality. From sailing around the world to launching a thriving business or just standing up for what you believe in, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. With your host, journalist Shelby Stanger. Welcome to episode four. Today's guest is outdoor wilderness and survival expert, Joel Vanderloon. This episode is brought to you by Graced by Grit. The women's fitness company was founded to help empower women cultivate their grit to find their grace. I love their name and I love their yoga and running pants. Not only do they make my booty look good, which is always important, but they offer classic styles and flattering fits made from the highest quality materials. They always look good on. Go to gracedbygrit.com and check them out. And when you enter the code wild ideas, you'll get 20% off your first order. This episode was also brought to you by Surf Diva. The original all-women surf school has been teaching group, private, all-women, and co-ed lessons at their stunning San Diego location for over 20 years. I've taught surf lessons there for years and seen hundreds of men and women come through, learn to ride waves, and it literally changes their lives. Go to surfdiva.com or give them a call, and when you book a lesson in San Diego and mention this show or the code Wild Ideas you'll get a $10 gift card to use towards your next lesson or in their store. Today's guest, Joel Vanderloon of Tanzania, talks about wilderness skills everyone should have, his wild encounters with terrifying animals, including, well, you'll have to listen and find out, and why having a deeper connection to the outside and nature is so important more today than ever before. So, Joel, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you do? Okay, so I am the owner and the instructor of Bush Mechanics. Um, it's a survival school that's based in California, but we run survival courses, of course, here and then in Nicaragua in the jungle and in Tanzania, Africa. So we focus on teaching survival skills, bushcraft skills, primitive skills, and, uh, and basically I do some guiding stuff too. And I love that you've used the word bush because when I first heard that word uh, in New Zealand and in South Africa, I kind of giggled because I'm immature and... Yeah. Um, so the bush refers to the, the wilderness, the jungle. The, the bush refers to the outside. The outside. It can be okay. desert. It can be the, the the mountains. It can be the woods. Uh, to us, the bush is is every encompasses everything. And tell me a little bit about where you're from originally, because this accent is is amazing, and I know the ladies love it, and um, the guys love it too. So, uh, talk to me about it. Uh, well, I. I come from a, a family of gypsies. So I initially my, my ancestors are Dutch, okay? But my Dutch ancestors being uh, the most relevant ones, my grandpa and granny, they traveled around the world a lot with, with their kids, um, of which one is my father. And they ended up um, in Australia where my dad was born, okay? Which makes him Australian. And so he ended up meeting my mother, who was South African when they immigrated to South Africa after Australia. Got it. So then I was born in South Africa. They then decided to go back to Australia. So we went back to Australia and we lived out of a, a caravan or a trailer, as you call it here in the US, um, for a few years until they decided to go back to South Africa, which then we pretty much settled down. So we were in, I lived in South Africa until I was about 18 years old, of which my parents separated when I was eight. And my dad then moved up to Tanzania, East Africa, where he's, he's lived for the past uh, little over 20 years. But you lived in a pretty rustic uh, neighborhood in y yeah, East Africa, it was, right? Yeah, it was a big change. I mean, I, I grew up in, in South Africa in a, in a small farming community uh, uh, along the coast, a sugarcane farming community. And my dad then went up to Tanzania, East Africa, which is uh, quite different to South Africa. South Africa is the, the cosmopolitan or the first world part of, of um, Africa, if you will. Uh, Tanzania is, is deepest, darkest Africa. So he went up there uh, when it was still very much undeveloped and ended up... we actually found a plot of land as a family and uh, fell in love with it. And he ended up buying it, but it was completely off the grid. So we had to develop everything from scratch. We literally hiked into it, bushwhacked into this property and um, had to start clearing it out. And it took a considerable amount of years, but eventually there was a house constructed. We had a well, we had solar, we had wind power. 
Um, and it had the combination of a lot of wild animals which still live, live naturally on that property. And, and we had the, the, the seaside right there. So it was just an amazing, amazing experience. So for those of you listening, Joel's a surfer. I mean, he's a total Southern California looking surfer, but he grew up in the bush of Africa and learned all sorts of skills. Maybe we can talk a little bit about some of their survival skills you teach you just taught us fire building, but you also teach people how to live basically in the wilderness or in the bush with nothing but their water bottles. Sure. So I like, uh, like my, um, where I really come from is, is I really like to come from a place of teaching people to do things um, in the bush with very little tools. I'm a strong believer in that. The less you have, um, you know, you, you could do really well having very minimal tools or you could do really badly. But if you train to do well with minimal tools, anything extra that you have is always going to make life easier. So I teach a series of skills which always focuses on the minimalist type uh, scheme that, that I have. And so that would encompass things like building uh, primitive shelters, uh, navigation, of course, sourcing water and purifying water, um, building fires with modern and primitive techniques, um, tr uh, primitive trapping, hunting tools, um, you know, animal tracking and behavior techniques, and a bunch more things. But that encompasses what I focus on. And does this, I mean, why, why do you do what you do? Is it because when you're a little kid, you, you grew up having to use these tools? Yeah, I've just had this like intense passion for adventure and nature. And, you know, it's, um, it's just, it's kind of, the path took me in this direction and I just fell in love with it immediately and completely related to it instantaneously. So I draw on all of my experience um, of which a lot is with animals and the African bush. However, I've spent, you know, over 10 years traveling the world and, you know, been in over 40 countries. So I, I can actually pull experience from various types of terrains and climates of which I've done numerous adventures with, you know, minimal, uh, you know, equipment. And so I kind of, I kind of put all those pieces together and put together a survival training course, which can appeal to, to people really that are going into most type of environments. So I want to go back a little bit to you as a kid, because it sounds like you had a pretty incredible upbringing in the bush and your dad was a, an adventurer. Yeah. Can you tell about yeah. me maybe one or two experiences with your dad that, that you'll never forget that sort of helped influence what you do today? You know, there's, first of all, there's, it started off at a very young age and there's a whole lot of small memories that I have of him taking me out and building tree houses and shelters. And, you know, I was actually operating, uh, using knives and making fires at the age of five, which wow. to me now seems like, I think, what were my parents thinking, you know? But they kind of gave me that independence and they let me run with it. And I'm so glad for it. But as I got older and actually became more physically capable of doing, of pushing limits a little more, um, it, we had a lot of fun and some of the things that do stick out is we actually had heard about an underground cave system on Zanzibar Island and this is this was way before Zanzibar was renowned as an international tourist destination we hiked out with scuba tanks and we found it we had to lower everything down and rappel down into this cave wow. and we actually found an opening underground um, is, which was what we were specifically looking for. And we had to squeeze in through the gap, put our scuba gear on after we had got into the gap. And we ended up cave diving, completely unexplored cave. And it opened up into this huge room. Uh, it was just phenomenal, breathtaking. And I think that the, the travel to actually get there and find it, which is what myself and my dad have always loved the most, it's always about the adventure more so than the actual activity, um, was just so amazing, you know. And I, I mean, I could keep you here for hours telling you about cool stories that, I, that I've done with my dad, but, you know, there's, there's been a lot and I'm really grateful for them. That's so interesting that you were given so many tools as a five-year-old because in America that doesn't really happen no no that's there's a lot of things in america that have been quite eye-opening for me but uh yeah growing up growing up there we we literally as kids grow up um you know barefoot playing in the bush you know that's that's very very much the norm getting dirty 
So we're going to jump ahead. You said when you first came to America from, from Africa, there was some pretty big shocks. <laughs> One being McDonald's. Yeah, I told you that story. Well, I sailed over to America in 2006, if I'm not mistaken, for the first time. And how old were you? I was 20. I was 20. I think I was 20 or 21. And of course, all my visions in my head were of what we see on TV. So I got to Florida and I managed to get a day off and I, I went out exploring and I never forget seeing my first McDonald's and I chose not to do the drive through Let's go in. Let's go check it out. So I walked into McDonald's and I walk up to the counter and of course, I of course, I order a Big Mac meal. You know, she asked me, do you want the meal? I'm like, yeah, I want the meal. So I have, you Wait, know- Were this... you confused what she meant by the meal? Well, yes, I was because, <laughs> you know, back home, you either order the burger- the fries or the Coke. Like if they say the meal, like we don't say that. So I don't didn't know that a meal encompassed a drink and the fries. God, you thought like, so, yes, I want a meal, a food. I navigated myself through that one though. And I kind of put two and two together. So I knew it encompassed everything. But then she hands me, you know, the cup, which of course was monstrously huge uh, compared to what I'm seeing. And I was like, wow, it's a big cup. But I couldn't help notice the cup was empty. And so I look in the cup, you know, there's nothing in there. And she's looking at me like, you know, we're done here. And <laughs> I look at her and I'm like, I'm sorry, what am I missing? The cup's empty. So she's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, what do, how do I get soda? And she's like, well, you see over there? There's a soda fountain. You know, you can go and help yourself. I'm like, help myself. So, okay, so I can go and help myself. But does it, what, does it time out when the level of the, you know, the cup's, you know, full? She's like, no, it's, it's bottomless. You, you can have as much as you want. And I remember thinking to myself, that is insane. If they had this in South Africa, they would go bankrupt within a week because everyone would come in there and fill up like, you know, four liter bottles and stuff and, and take the Coke home. And they would, they would drink as much Coke as they could and they'd make sure they get their money's worth. So that was absolutely crazy to me, the thought of bottomless Coke. It's so <laughs> funny. It's always interesting to hear people's first impression of America when they... They grew up living so wild. You said you even lived with the Maasai. Um, so yeah, I, I got to know them really well and they taught me a lot and I really uh, cherished my time with them. Will you tell the, uh, the listeners kind of what the Maasai are and then maybe some of your favorite lessons you've, you've learned from the Maasai? Sure. So the Maasai are, they nomadic herdsmen is what they are. So everything revolves around cattle for them. So unlike hunter-gatherers, they actually farmers. And they live uh, traditionally up in the northern part of Tanzania, southern um, part of Kenya, on the Maasai Steppe. They still, a lot of them still live very rurally, and they pretty much live exactly how they did thousands of years ago. Mm. However, a lot of them have branched out now into urban areas, and of course, like our Maasai, we employ them, and they they travel down from north to come down south to us uh, to seek employment. A lot of them are doing that. But traditionally, they are quite. Um, uh, they, they have a very, very intricate culture, and it's you know, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to their culture alone. But um, mostly, they're renowned for their ability to actually attack lions, hunt lions, to fend off, of course, um, their cattle, cattle from being taken and eaten, but also it's a traditional thing for them. Um, it's a sign of being a man if you can kill a lion. It's a very, very uh, respectful uh, thing to do is to be able to kill a lion. And of course, the more lions you kill, it kind of ups your status. So did you learn how to kill lions? No, I didn't. Okay. No, I listened to all their stories and was always fascinated by them. Um, but uh, I, I have certainly not tried to kill a lion. I was just going to say your wife's in the room and that would be an incredible pickup line. Like, <laughs> I kill lions. What, what else did you learn from the Messiah? Just, I mean, I, I want to be respectful. Messiah are, are incredible humans. and They are incredible the humans. Line, but, um, they really are. And uh, one of the things, okay, of course, I learned a lot of skills from them. So, you know, my foundation of tracking and really a lot of um, animal uh, awareness um, came from them. However, something that I always for the rest of my life will take away from them is that they actually get ridiculed by the local Kiswahili people a lot for being more like animals because the Messiah will travel around with nothing. 
they will live their life with nothing. Their shuka, which is their clothing garment, um, and they have a tools. They usually carry a knife, a rungu, which is like a clubbing. It's a, it's a small club. And sometimes they'll carry spears, not when they're in urban areas. And that is all they'll carry. If, if they're tired and they're going to sleep, they'll lie down in the dirt, cover themselves with the shuka, and they'll sleep. And they'll wake up and they'll carry on with their lives. They, I've never experienced any other human beings live so simply. And I appreciate that so much in a world where we take so much for granted and we have so much. Um, I really respect them for that. And I, and I kind of aspire. That's where I think maybe a bit of my minimalist type of attitude comes from. You know, if they can do it with all they got, you know, I can get by with a lot less. Oh, living simply is such a beautiful thing. It is the freedom. And they take it to such another level. That's, that's a really good lesson. Um, so, so you have had some encounters with animals. What, what's the scariest encounter, I guess, you've had with an animal? Yeah, there's a couple. Let's see. The most recent one is I went on a solo survival trip in the desert and I got down to a, a desert oasis, a water source. And this is an area that's never, ever um, traveled. Can, by, can you by say human where beings. it was? Um, I'd rather not because okay. uh, since I found it, it's actually my little secret spot. What state? And what what country? Here, here in Southern California. Okay, it's in Southern California. Here in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And as you know, here in Southern California with a big population, when you find these little spots, I tend to keep it on the, the down. Got it. Okay. <laughs> we'll respect that. So hiking in, I found a lot of sign of mountain lion. A lot. And it kind of was surprising at how much there was around and decided to um, build a shelter because... I went out there with no tools. Um, I was doing a bit of filming. So I decided to build a shelter with a door completely enclosed for that reason. I just wasn't aware of, of you know, of, I want it's, there's something about having a shelter completely covering you at night. You know, mentally it helps a lot. And in that area with all that sign, I decided that's what I was going to do. And I'm so glad I did. Because at about 4 a.m. in the morning, I woke up to you know, footsteps on the dead leaves oh. and I could hear it was a big animal and I heard it approach the shelter. I mean, I could hear everything. It was so still and so quiet and absolutely no doubt it's a mountain lion for sure. And he was outside the shelter. I couldn't see out. He couldn't see in. He obviously could pick up on my scent mm. and he started growling, a very slow, deep growl. And, uh, I tell you my heart rate, I think was the highest it's ever been in my life. And, um, he carried on for a little while and there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that it was a territorial standoff. And the fact that I was in the shelter, you know, where I was not visible and it was a completely natural shelter, that kind of created sort of like a barrier. So I'm very glad I had that barrier because, of course, eventually he walked off. And, uh, Did nothing, you stay quiet? Nothing. I, I st of course. Okay. I didn't move. I didn't make a sound. I just wow. listened and eventually, you know, heard him move off and that was it. But in the morning, of course, all the tracks were there. I found uh, feces a little further down. And uh, that was that was a pretty scary experience simply because he was only six feet away from me. That's that's incredible. Um, I, I think that brings me to the next question is, what should everyone know about survival? What, what are the top skills that everyone should know to survive in any situation in the wilderness? Well, there are numerous but I'd say the most important ones, I mean, I, I look at it at two, two ways, okay? You've got your mental and then you've got, you know, your, your skills, okay? Because the skills, of course, are going to be very important, okay? So going to a survival school and learning, learning how to do things like make fire and build shelters, of course, that is going to prepare you. But there is absolutely no substitute for having good ingenuity, so improvisational skills, and a, a good mental, um, you know, the will, the willpower, it will take people a long way. But if you can have the combination of the willpower and the skills, then that can take you a very, very long way and almost not make it easy, but you could be in situations where you could be completely calm and collected. Because don't forget, panic is what kills everyone. You know, people get lost and they panic and usually they get themselves more lost and they end up stay having to spend a night in the wilderness and die of hypothermia. They try to climb up a tree to get a lookout and they end up falling down and, and, and breaking bones. I mean, it all a lot of it stems off panic. So um, get, having a combination of the skills um, and, of course, the mental aspect, which does 
Of course, some people have it and some people don't when it comes to willpower, but that can also be trained. And that is where I kind of branch off into a little bit of what I call like nature awareness. The more familiarity you have with nature, the more comfort you're going to have with it. So when you're out there and a problem arises, you're not in an unfamiliar environment. Therefore, you'll have a much more calm, collected way of tackling any problem. So how does the average human who works a nine to five job start training for this mental awareness? Sure. Getting out into nature and sticking to areas that they feel comfortable in at first and then pushing a little more and a little more and a little more. Of course, this is what I do. So... I would hope that they would go to a survival school, a reputable one, and learn the skills. And th- learning those skills and simple things like learning how to identify some you know, plants that they can actually eat and some plants that um, should be avoided because they're poisonous and learning the basics of what to do and what not to do, how to purify water. There's very, very simple things to learn that can be the difference of life and death. And once they have a little bit of a skill set under their belt, everything that everything is going to just be a little bit easier and they're going to get a little more confidence. But honestly, nature is the true teacher. And being out there and having open senses and using your common sense, nature will teach you. If you're open to it and you're listening and you're watching, it'll teach you what you need to know. So it's a food, water, shelter, three, three skills. If I could, if I well, had to Well, don't forget learn fire. Fire. <laughs> yeah. So if I had to learn, you know, four skills only and I was going to go... On a back, on a backpacking trip, I was only going to bring a bottle of water. What do I learn first? Fire. It has a lot to do with your location. Don't forget, of course, um, in the rainforests, we're not really concerned about hypothermia as much as we are water. Okay, up in California, especially once we get into elevation, we're very concerned about hypothermia and not so much water. So that's where fire would, of course, be our first go-to point. And you never really know which one you're going to need the most. However, I always say it like this. Think of the first thing that's going to kill you, and that's what you eradicate. The next thing that's going to kill you, that's what you eradicate. And if you just think about – if you think about it that way, then it gives you a very um, – uh, good approach at how to knock out the things that are going to be serious threats to you. you. You have this really beautiful belief about being outside and why it's so important. And you also think that we've gotten too soft as, as humans. Yeah. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, f- first of all, the connection. So human beings, and, and I include myself, you know, we, of course, I, I try and fight it, but we all need balance, right? We all have to eat, the, we have to have the combination of a healthy diet, we have to have a combination of exercise, and, you know, we need that combination to, to be healthy mentally and physically and be fulfilled. So, you know, you look at, an example I think of is like a hippopotamus, okay? It needs the combination of water and land, It lives in the water during the day, during the heat, and it uses the water to regulate its body temperature. At night, it comes out and it feeds on the land. Okay, it can't really survive without the balance of the two. And I feel like the relationship is exactly the same for human beings. Yes, we can go into urban environments and be completely surrounded by cars and you know, electronics and millions of people, we can do that and we can survive because there's so much, the world is so modern that everything we need is brought into these urban areas. But I don't believe we can be truly happy and fulfilled. I don't believe that. I think you have to have a balance of nature and an urban environment with all your conveniences and that and things people love. And so it's interesting because you live in an urban environment right now. You live in San Diego yeah. But you teach wilderness survival and you get outside a lot. But you've <laughs> yeah. made this you've made this your profession and it it's take you also this is your side hustle right now. You also work as a marine engineer. Yep. So tell me a little bit about what was that aha moment when you decided, "Hey, I I have to do this for a living. No matter what it takes, I'm going to be a marine engineer on the side, build websites, whatever it is, and I'm going to get people outside because that's my passion. Well, I was doing a survival course myself and it, you know, seven day survival course. And 
it was only after the first few days that I just knew straight away, this is what I want to do. This is the change. I was already looking at, at a change. You know, I'd, I'd been at sea for many years and I was kind of a little bit over that. And I just transitioned back to land and I kind of wanted to get out of the boating. And so, Wait, tell us real quick. So you were at sea for how long? And you did what? Well, 10 to 12 years as, as a marine engineer, as a as a, f- a first mate and as a captain. So I did various things. But all around the world? You all around the world, yeah. Boat. Like across the um, the Atlantic, across the Indian Ocean. Um, you know, spent a lot of time in the Caribbean, South Pacific. Um, so your bar was high. Yes. <laughs> you weren't grinding the corporate ladder. Absolutely. Oh, uh, no. In your 20s. You were uh, sailing absolutely. around the world. Yeah. Never done anything even remotely close to being corporate. Never will. But um, so you were you were at this survival school, you said, and you just decided. Yeah, um, I was looking for a transition already, as I said, and I found it. I knew it straight away. And um, the funny enough, myself and and the owner of the school, uh, you know, hit it off, and he offered me a job, and I, and I started, you know, intensely training, and then instructing, and and that's been the path that I've been on since, and now it's my passion. What have you learned from being a wilderness guide? Because it's one thing to go out in the wilderness <laughs> alone. It's another to take other people. It is totally different. Totally different. Um, patience. <laughs> patience. Um, I, I don't really consider myself as being the most patient person in the world. But I feel like with age and experience, I'm getting a lot better at it. However, with the survival training, I've had to bring that to a whole new level. And, and and it really is teaching me the real essence of patience. And I actually appreciate that lesson. You know, I'm I'm really um taking it in. But that is certainly something that I that is the most challenging. And what's the best part about taking people outside into the wilderness and teaching them these really valuable skills? The best part has got to be their faces, just like, you know, seeing you and Johnny when you guys achieved fire. Learning there, fire, just so you know, it, <laughs> it took a long time with a piece of string and harvesting wood from the forest. Um, yeah. So you, so you did the. <laughs> it bo- was so cool when it happened. Though. You did the bode rule method. Yes. Which is, uh, which is one of the easier friction fire methods. Great. That was easy. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it still takes a considerable amount of patience and uh, and and skill and technique there's a combination but you guys did it and seeing your faces and other students faces when they do achieve fire is for me it's it's really what makes it worthwhile to me you've had some really really unique experiences um, especially in the wilderness what are some of the most memorable i guess wilderness survival experiences you've had outside of your encounter with with the mountain lion the other day or um well they're all memorable uh for different reasons um but i'd have to say that you know there's two that come off the top of my head is that alaska was certainly spectacular alaska i was there for 10 days and um it was truly breathtaking because it was so different to any terrain that but I'd ever experienced. You went with nothing but your water well, bottle? Well, ni- I had a knife. I had okay. a knife. I had a knife, a knife, a folding saw, and a water bottle. And then, of course, the clothes that I was wearing. Yeah. Wow. And um, what are some of the most memorable places you've been that you would love to go back to? Oh, that list is long. Um, memorable places, I'd have to say that... Once again, Alaska, hiking up Exit Glacier, eight hours, get to the top, and you look down on the ice fields. That was truly just unbelievable. Um, Raja Ampat Archipelago in Indonesia, purely for its desolation. Um, it's an archipelago of all these deep water channels uh, intertwining between these islands, and there's not, I mean, we didn't see a single trace of a human being wow. for, for like over a week. It was unbelievable. And the marine life is so rich. So that was really spectacular. Um, the Galapagos, the proximity at which you can get to the animals. I mean, you, you can't experience like that anything like that anywhere else in the world. It's unreal, completely devoid of fear of human beings. Um, so yeah, those so definitely these are stand out. Three on the bucket list right now. <laughs> yeah. If you were stranded on a, an island and you could only take three things with you, what would you take? I'd take my wife, my dog, and some sunscreen. That's awesome because you could survive. <laughs> you, you don't think about these things. What about food? If you could only have three, three foods to survive on for like the rest of your life, what would you eat? Okay. 
because I'm a very practical person, I would, p- I would pick a combination of very practical foods and tasty foods. So I'd go with avocados, chicken, and rice. Avocados, chicken, and rice—that's a balanced meal, isn't it? It's it's balanced if you're not a vegan. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing some TV stuff now. I know you can only talk a little bit about it, so maybe just give a, just tell us, hey, I'm doing TV stuff, and this is the kind of things I'm doing. Just give us a sneak, sneak, sneak peek into your life on TV and what we might expect later on. So I think, well, I'm hoping if all the stars align that. I will be on a survival show um, in this upcoming year, 2000 and uh, what year is it? 2016. So 2017. Um, I'm currently in negotiations with Discovery and History, and I'm kind of like torn actually between two. And I feel very fortunate to have to make that decision. Um, but I can't really say anything about the show. Okay, um, so, so we can expect to see you on TV doing your wilderness stuff. Hopefully. I, I really hope to, to be there, yeah. Well, that'll be interesting to talk to when you're when you're filming. Um, what are the most essential gear items that you know they can be kind of luxury items you can buy them at the store, but that you love and that you think everybody taking any of your courses should buy or have in the wilderness? If they sure. want to get outside. Sure. So um, the getting back to the my whole minimalist approach um, for me, the Swiss Army knife. Uh, in particular, the the one hand tracker model uh, because it's got the locking blade and uh, it's got a really it's got a bigger blade and a bigger saw. But of course, the Swiss Army um, knife has been tried and tested over a long time, and the simplicity of it, the durability of it, and the diversity of it. It's just a fantastic tool. I actually use that most of the time. Um, the saw feature on the Swiss Army knife is by far superior to any other multi-tool. So although very small, um, we tend to use that a lot for whittling, you know. So the Swiss Army knife is a huge recommendation I always have. As far as fixed blade knives, um, I, there's a lot of brands out there. But all I'll say about that is, you know, you've got a choice um, between stainless steel blades and full tang knives and like there's a ton of choices out there so i'll just give a quick um qu- give a few options to the listeners to you know to help them choose when they're going to be picking a knife and that is you have the choice of going with a, a carbon steel a high carbon steel blade fixed blade or you have stainless steel um, those are the two common ones in the market right now the stainless steel of course is going to be very hard but it's actually going to be brittle Whereas the carbon steel is going to be softer but extremely strong. And not only that, uh, the high carbon steel will actually throw a spark if you take a piece of chert or, you know, there's various rocks around, you strike it against the blade and actually give you a spark, which uh, can be very useful at making fire. Um, it's easy to sharpen in the field, whereas stainless steel is not because it's harder. So, so that's some of the materials and then what they call full tang where the blade actually extends all the way through to the back of the handle makes it very useful for batoning. So you can actually really beat the knife up without worrying about it breaking. So those are some of the aspects you want to look at in a knife. Personally, for me, a knife is a knife. I'll use anything. I'll use a machete. I'll use a full tang. I'll use stainless steel. If it cuts, I'll use it. Come on, we watched that movie with um, the rock climber in Utah. I'm yeah. drawing a blank, but he didn't have a sharp knife and that looked like the most painful experience cutting off his arm. Absolutely. Um, that's a survivor right there. Yeah, it's a great story. So so speaking of people who influence you, who influences you most growing up and who influences you most now? Well, so growing up, certainly my family, I, I cannot... Um, Sometimes it amazes me how much freedom and independence they gave to me to be able to to kind of pave my own path. You know, I've I've done a lot of things in my life, a lot of different things, and I'm kind of like I want to, you know, accomplish something and then I want to accomplish something else and then I want and they never ridiculed me for that, you know, when it came to finishing high school and then I didn't want a normal job. They just supported whatever decision I made. So that really means so much to me. And it's it's really given me the confidence to really go after my dreams. You know, when you're beaten down all the time, told you you're not going to be able to achieve that, of course, that's going to affect your mental will. Well, I had the opposite. I was boosted and always whatever decision I made was supported. So I'm, I was really thankful for that. 
Um, so my family's a big one. Another person, you know, who's who's a really, really big deal to me in my life um, is a guy by the name of Ryan Levinson, who's got muscle dystrophy. And he's currently in stages where he cannot lift his arms up above his shoulders, you know. But yet him and his wife have sailed across the Pacific. They're actually in French Polynesia now, living on their boat, living their dream, and every day going through hardships. I mean, if you think it's hard being having muscle dystrophy in a natural environment, like where you have wheelchairs and you have a couch and stuff, can you imagine being on a, a rocking and rolling 30-odd foot sailboat, you know, dealing with lowering sails, raising sails, winching in, winching out, just, just actually standing is often a, a chore. And they are, he's out there doing it. And it just proves to me that we really can do anything we put our minds to. Yeah, Ryan's coming on the show pretty soon, so we're excited to have him on. He's actually the guy who introduced us. And you have a wife, and you're about to have a kid. Yeah. Boy or girl? Boy. It's definitely a boy. It's going to be a boy. How soon are you going to give him or her a knife? (laughs) We've, you know, myself and my wife have had this discussion, and thankfully that she's she's on board with giving kids independence, you know, and, and learning from their mistakes at a young age. So... Um, I as soon as they're old enough to competently handle a knife, and I'll be the judge of that. I will let them handle a knife as well as let let them make fire, as well as let them play in the dirt. I will give them that freedom to to go out and take risks and fail and learn from it. Do you read it all a little bit? You know, I do. Awesome. I do. I'm not a big reader, but there's certain books I love, and there's a lot I don't. Okay, what books do you love or recommend for people to read? Um survival based or any book any book any book well seeing as though we're talking about connection to nature i really feel like they should get hold of a book by john young okay he's the author it's called bird language it'll open up people's minds to the language of birds which is something that people might have heard of but i feel like it's something that 90 percent of the world would never have heard of understanding the language of birds just like we would go and try to understand Italian or Spanish well there is actually a way of learning bird language and it's something I'm really into and I feel like that's a really good start for people connecting to nature so that's that's one I could recommend for sure that sounds like a great book what's the best gift you've ever received well I think we just spoke about that the uh, oh the knife the, no no no, having a baby. Having a baby. Oh. <laughs> I think the best gift I've ever been given is my gift to my wife and myself and the planet. So I I think that this is the best thing I could have ever ever asked for. Oh, we're looking forward to meeting him or her. <laughs> if you could fly an eco-friendly plane over the world and it could read one message, and it's an eco-friendly plane, so it's it's okay for the environment. Okay, good. What would it say? <laughs> What's your message to the world? Um, you know, I there's a million things. I I'll keep it simple and I'll just say that follow your passion. Follow your passion. That's it's been a very crucial part of my life. It still is and I I think a lot of, a lot more people can should consider that. Where is the best place to surf in the world? What country? <laughs> taking into consideration crowds consistency beauty french polynesia all right everybody's moving to french polynesia (laughs) sorry ryan (laughs) for someone looking to get into the outdoors and uh do more survival things what are some great resources that they can look to are there websites courses there you know, there's there's a lot of YouTube videos which are really good. There's a lot of YouTube videos that are really bad. And of course, they're just going to have to take everything with a pinch of salt. But I'd really do recommend the videos. Um, there's a lot of good books out there. Um, you know, so more of the bushcraft type scene. You know, Dave Canterbury's got a, a couple of good books. Um, Les Stroud recently came out with the book uh, Survive. And that's... That's one I really endorse because it's kind of like a, you know, no, it's it's a real life 
you can see his experience coming through the book and you can see that it's short and sweet and simple and effective. There's no like glitz and glamour, no talking about drinking your own pee and, and silly things like that. <laughs> he gets cut straight to the chase uh, of what is achievable and what's not achievable. So I th I'd say as far as reading a survival book, that's a good go-to. And uh, where, can, where, can audience, where can the audience and listeners find out more about you? Well, there is my website, bushmechanicssurvival.com. There is my Facebook account, Bush Mechanic Survival Training. Um, I also have a YouTube channel, which is also Bush Mechanic Survival Training. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, well, Joel, is there, is there anything else we should talk about? Um, I just want to say to, to the listeners that if you are intimidated by doing a survival course, which is something I come across a lot, um, don't be. This is... The objective of what I do, and I can't speak for other schools, is not to force feed them bugs and make them sleep a night extremely cold. And that's not the objective. The objective is to pass down skills, real skills that are simple and effective that can help keep them alive in any situation. And the combination of just trying to influence that bond between them and nature. And that's what I promote. So if that's something they're looking for, then by all means... Yeah, no, we we really loved our fire course. Um, it was friendly, it was unintimidating, and I was making fire, and our clothes still smell like fire. And it's, <laughs> it's a it's a great smell. Um, so thank you, Joel, for coming. For those listening, check out bushmechanicsurvival.com. They have great classes. They're affordable. Uh, you can check out Joel on YouTube, on Facebook, and we'll put it all up in the show notes. Thanks so much, and have a great day. Thanks again for tuning into episode four. Joel's a great guy, and he actually forgot to mention a few things, like the fact that he was a top-ranked MMA fighter, a national surf champ in his home country, and he did just film a TV pilot, so things are coming in hot for Joel. We'll be having a Wild Ideas Worth Living fire-making session, so you can learn how to make fire with Joel this spring, so stay tuned by signing up for the newsletter at wildideasworthliving.com. Our next guest is the guy Joel just mentioned. Ryan Levinson and his wife, Nicole, left San Diego two years ago to sail into their dreams in French Polynesia. We talk about how hard it was to untie the dock lines and how anyone can sail across the Pacific. Hear some great stories about their encounters with the locals in the village and locals in the water like... Well, you'll have to find out next week and tune in to hear more. Don't forget to rate the show on iTunes and write a review. And don't forget some of the best adventures happen when you follow your wildest ideas. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next week.